All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. Mindful Hunter Podcast. I'm your host as always, Jay Nickel. And we kind of got a local fan favorite here, Travis Bader, in from Silver Core. Thank you very much for coming in, my friend. Thank you very much for having me. Beautiful setup you have here, by the way. Yeah, I'm kind of tucked away. Nick, you can't see it off camera, but I think uh, we moved here about two and a half years ago. And as soon as I walked into the basement, I was like, we're done. I, yeah. don't, I don't need anything else because w- w- I should show you later, but my office is over there with my mounts and stuff, and I got my gear room in there, and this little space really works for what I do. Yeah, you got it set up perfectly. Yeah, Love thanks, it. man. Thanks. So maybe give the listeners like a little 30-second intro, kind of what you do and, and, and who you're with and where you're from. 30 seconds. Holy <laughs> crow. Uh, so I'm the host of the Silvercore podcast. I own a company called Silvercore Outdoors. You're safe. You didn't get any on you. Okay, we're good. good. And um, yeah, there you go. I've been uh, started, what, 94, started teaching a basic firearm safety course, and I was doing gunsmithing for armored cars and some extended work for law enforcement and for government agencies, and started building that one out and really liked the training side, so started building training programs out from there and okay. did Silver Corps Gunworks. Expanded into Silver Core training, uh, now into the iteration of Silver Core Outdoors, where we are today. Okay. Um, where are you from originally? You a BC boy? BC boy, born and raised in Surrey. I'm a okay. Surrey boy. So let's let's skip back to the beginning, and then we'll kind of get in. I did my core through Silver Core. That's right. Um, so it's funny. I'm uh, and I looked it up the other day, and it was in April of 2014. And sometimes I don't give myself enough credit for how long I've been kind of mountain hunting in BC. And then I was like. Been a decade, man. Totally. Like wild. Time flies. Time certainly flies. Yeah. And it was funny, I had to look that up because if you don't write your hunter safety number down in BC at the time you get it, it's not something that's like easily publicly available. And funnily enough, the people who actually track that is the BC Wildlife Federation. For what? The the province does your like your FWID, which was yes. your resident hunter number, but your graduation form yep. for your for your core supposedly is going to be tracked by your in- examiner instructor for at least two years yeah and, and then on to the federation and and once it goes there they should have a record of that yeah and you you know what they're pretty good they've got a good system for keeping track of that now but i don't know they've been doing that since what the 80s yeah i just wasn't aware that they were uh, maybe i don't know as deeply as I should, what the actual BCWF, like how they're integrated. But for example, we were talking about hunting in the States. Mm. And when you go to Maui or Hawaii, Mm -hmm. they're fine to just phone um, BC Wildlife, not BCWF, but like our fish and game. And they're like, yeah, because what they don't understand is that we have to do hunter safety to get an FWID. So even though your FWID isn't technically your hunter safety number, it should be proof by proxy that you have it but when i went to colorado doesn't cut it right you need the real number Mm. so i had to go through this like crazy chain reaction and for 25 bucks bcwf will email you a pdf that has your original graduation certificate number from silver core or wherever you do which is invaluable for some of these states where you have to prove hunter safety because some of them accept enough like i've used my fwid in idaho for years no one's ever said anything really? about it i think certain states just have more stringent you know what i think it is hmm. i think a certain states are holding other people to their standard and they yeah. figure that everybody else kind of well we do it like this i'm sure they must do it like that yes and when you say oh, let's say maui so i did molokai uh, yeah what was it last year maybe the year before time flies I uh, did an access deer hunt over there and uh, they literally called up the BC Wildlife Federation yeah. and they talked to Pam who was at the front oh, desk. they called the BCWFs because when we were talking, I thought they actually called like BC's fishing no, game. No. Oh. They, they, literally, they call the BC Wildlife Federation. Pam's like, oh yeah, no, he's done it. He's good. He's a, an examiner and a, they call him a facilitator. Okay. Firearm safety course, you have instructors and master instructors. So I'm a master instructor for teaching instructors and then... For the hunter education, I'm a facilitator, so I can help facilitate new examiners come on through. Okay. Okay. So. That that helps clarify some things. That makes some sense. Okay. Bit of a tangent. Let's go up but back a little bit. I would love to hear your early story of hunting, how you got exposed to it. Well, good question. So growing up, my family had, we were part owners in, and we call it a, a commercial fly fishing lodge. Okay. But uh, it was a lodge. 
that had a commercial permit and then one of the owners was a lawyer and every year he'd keep that permit up to date and he'd keep the uh, crown land lease renewed every single year i think it was a 25 year crown land lease so growing up i was out in the bush a fair bit okay uh, fly in or walk in hike in only sort of uh, location but uh, that was fishing so okay. out there fishing and a little bit of grouse hunting even though now that i'm older and i realize probably shouldn't have been grouse hunting when i was <laughs> When I was there and I know a little bit more about how things are done, yeah. maybe I didn't have the uh, the right oversight at the time, but uh, man, I just loved being outside. I found there's just a massive connection to the outdoors. The actual hunting part of it, like my father was um, uh, ERT, VPD, and the group would go out on hunting trips. Okay. And I'd be like, oh man, I want to come out hunting. Can you take me out hunting? Never happened. So later on in life, I'm like, you know I love the outdoors. I love that connection with our natural environment. And I see hunting as a way just to deepen that connection because you're learning about the flora and the fauna. You're learning about yourself and everything around you. So I would be a, a later star. That didn't happen in my childhood aside okay. from fishing and grouse. And I would stalk animals. Like I would stop, uh, stalk lynx and I would stalk um, bobcat and I'd stalk bear and deer and all these things I probably shouldn't have been stalking, right? Yeah. Um, I remember one time the um, uh, guy comes out and says, oh, I saw a couple bear cubs. Really? I'm going to go stalk them. Not even like, you know, I'll, I'll be good. I'll keep my distance. But um, uh, you learn a lot through the process, which can be applied to hunting later on. So that brings up an interesting segue then. So how... Because I think the barriers to entry to hunting can be quite high. I think with mm. the advent of social media and there are other kind of programs and organizations that do make it somewhat easier, but I still do find for most people, if they lack some type of personal connection, like a buddy that they work with or a brother-in-law or something to bridge that gap, mm. it can be a pretty tough barrier to entry. So how did you make the move into actually going hunting? Well, yeah. The, what are the barriers to entry? Well, it's going to be a cost barrier because yeah. you're going to need equipment and you don't know what kind of equipment you need. Thankfully, we've got pe people like yourself who can do reviews and kind of get people on the right track and shed some light on it. Um, you're going to need training. You're going to probably be unsuccessful for a long time going out. So some mentorship would be nice. And if you don't have that connection, a lot of people just won't get into it. And traditionally yes. it was like a father or a grandfather being a male dominated activity. Nowadays we're seeing a lot of mothers and aunt, aunts and grandmothers and fathers and uncles that are wanting to reconnect with nature and getting into it later in life that are getting their kids into it. But for me, I just pushed ahead. Essentially I wanted, okay. and I started in, I guess, waterfowl would be kind of the, the big area. I had a neighbor, Greek fellow, his father was, uh, of course, very Greek hunter, loved to be outside hunting all the time. And uh, so I talked to him and I said, hey, I mean, I'm living here in Ladner. Um, That's a great place to start waterfowl hunting. 100% it is. Yeah. Yeah. And there's free, easy access. Like you just go off to Brunswick. Individuals right. want to go out and try it out. Find out what the rules are. I 100% encourage people, know the rules, go on out, check out the Brunswick or different areas, talk to farmers, get the lowdown from them. Uh, cause it normalizes hunting in the right. eyes of everybody else, provided people are doing things by the rules and doing it right. But waterfowl was kind of where I started. Okay. And, um, I learned that and I'm like, you know, this is kind of like it. It's a very social activity. It's very right. different than the stalking of the, uh, the bigger game that I do when I was younger and, uh, sort of moved forward from there. Okay. Okay. It was funny. We talked about barriers to entry too. I do think the interesting thing that's you know, about some upland game birds and waterfowl is it's not as psychologically intimidating when it's like, what am I supposed to do with this thing? Mm. I think like I can remember my first deer I had, it might've been Corey Jacobson's gutless method on an iPad. Mm. And I'm like literally sitting there, like watching something on the eye and like in the middle, I downloaded it onto the iPad because I knew I wasn't going to have service. Mm. I'm up in Haida Gwaii and I'm literally like watching something and cutting something and watching something and cutting something. So I do think that's a particularly interesting thing about birds because it's not as scary. Do you know, mm. like, yeah, there's still some processing. There's still some blood and guts, but like I can pick this thing up. I can move it around. It doesn't weigh 300 pounds. Yeah, and you're not concerned about the wastage of meat that you would be if you right. do things wrong on yes. a big game. Yes. And like, I got to pack this stuff back. And this one, hey, I throw it in the back of the pack. I can take it home. I can figure it out in my kitchen if I need to and have feathers everywhere. 
uh, yeah, that, that is an easier, and we tell a lot of people, like small game, you know, rabbits, grouse, waterfowl, what a fantastic way. It gets you out in the bush, it gets you in tune with just being still and, yep. and being in tune with your surroundings, and and it breaks down, like you are saying, that psychological barrier, because yeah. it, it can be intimidating if you've never been around someone or seen the process of processing an animal, I mean... Like you say, where do you start? Oh. And really, it's so damn easy. This is the part that people, I'm like, it is going to blow your mind how almost impossible to screw it up it is. Mm-hmm. Like once you get it, it's like a connect the dots drawing, man. Like mm. muscles just flow into muscles and yeah. bones are over here. And it's like, it is so intuitive once you've done it a few times that you wonder to yourself, like, why was this ever intimidating to me? I mean, and there's not just one way, one right way to yes. do it. There's a lot of ways you can skin the cat, so to speak. Yep. And as long as you're not damaging too much meat in the process yeah. and you're not uh, uh, tainting everything and you're making sure that you're, you're um, uh, leaving the evidence that's required wherever you are hunting of the animal, evidence of sex or species or whatever it might be, take your time, work your way through it. It's kind of hard to mess it up. I do want to take a minute, and maybe it, this would be an interesting segue because I'd like to get your opinion on it. I've noticed with the influx of new hunters without like individual mentorship, mm. some of the behaviors I've started to see are a little bit concerning. So there's this bit of a drama lately with somebody who, and I won't get into the details, but they didn't take care of meat real great. Mm. It was kind of put in game bags and dumped in a lake. Mm. It wasn't wrapped in plastic or anything. And then... I was talking to somebody else the other day and kind of comes from a hunting background, but new ish kind of getting back into it. And they talked about going on a moose hunt last year and they killed a bear on, you know, day one or two. Sure. And they're like, yeah, it was unfortunate. It rotted in camp before we got our moose. And I was mm. like, I was like, wait a second, what? And it was the same thing. The, the meat in the game bags were this, this goat meat that got taken while they were trying to get a sheep. Mm. And I noticed that there's almost like this hierarchy of animals and like some people care a lot about and some don't seem to get the respect that they're due. And I was just, it really, it really stunned me that it it wasn't even like they considered that they did something wrong. It was like, it didn't occur to them that it was inappropriate to let a bear rot in camp while they were hunting for a moose or maybe dump this goat meat in a bag for nine days while they go Mm. and hunt a sheep. And both people were like, well, what should I have done? And I was like, well, you don't pull the trigger Mm -hmm. unless you're willing to leave for that animal. Like if you're in a remote camp, and I mean, that's the problem we face. Like if we could just kill everything we ran into and deal with it later, like we would have a lot more options on the table. Mm -hmm. But it was like, that's one of the problems you're going to face. Like when you've got multiple tags in your pocket, you got to ask yourself like, okay, I just set, you know, let's say you're in a fly-in camp. It's early September and you just, you know, you, you, you killed a bear and you're on a moose hunt. It's like, okay, you just hit a timer for four days. Mm. I think it's pretty reasonable early September. If you can find a nice shady spot or a creek with like a nice down draft, mm-hmm. I don't think it's unreasonable to think we can protect this meat for four, sure. maybe five days. Or can you get a hold of the pilot and you dump the cash, have him come do a meat run, pick yep. everything up and, and run it back out. But I would be interested to hear from you because I do think you're somewhat on the front lines with all of the training. Do you see any kind of concerning trends of this kind of lack of mentorship or almost ignorance about some of the things that more diehard guys would consider that like, you know, stand like, yeah. yeah. From my perspective, I don't see that okay. concerning trend of people having a lack of respect for their for the life of the animal. Um, the concerning trend that I've seen is the uh, the void between, let's say, new hunter and experienced hunter. Right. Or uh, rifle hunter from bow hunter. Or, uh, you know, these, these different... Clicks. Yeah. These different little Interesting. subgroups that people will set up and the, um, and the gatekeeping of knowledge. Because, you know, if I see somebody out there and they're dressed different than me and they're doing things different than me, but they're out hunting and they're enjoying the process, they're kind of in my area. This is my, this is my area, right? What is my area, right? I can look at it from a couple of standpoints. I can say, what the heck? I've been doing this for so many years. And what is this person doing? Or I can look at it for the reality of what it is. And that reality is 
there's somebody new who's excited and wants to get in here. Maybe there's an education process that we can look at. Wow, right. I've got an ally, somebody that can now speak to this different demographic that I'm not a part of and, and kind of get them in. So that would be the um, the isolation of knowledge and these, these clicks would be, to my mind, a more concerning thing that I've seen uh, where people say, you know, this I'm a pro, I've done this, this is a way to do it. And it's a closed-minded approach to the future of firearms and hunting and outdoor activities uh, which is only going to hurt people. The wasting of uh, meat, something I, most, all new people I see coming through, they're afraid to take anything because yeah. they don't know how to deal with it afterwards. And they'll spend a few years not wanting to take something because they, I just don't want to mess it up. And they, you know, everything wasn't perfect. I see more of that than I see on the other side. So yeah, but that education piece has been really helped, I think, by like Meat Eater, right? Right. Uh, COVID really helped enthuse a bunch of people to want to yep. get outside, be self-sufficient. And I guess they have this idea, I'm going to farm and hunt. I'll never go hungry, hungry again. Well, there's a learning curve here. Yeah, right? for sure. So yeah, that and online education as well has uh, helped bridge a gap for a lot of people and set a, at least a minimum standard of knowledge of laws and, and safety and ethics that uh, um, might might vary between uh, examiner and examiner across the country. Yeah, it was interesting too, because both the individuals I'm thinking of were kind of more like old school BC family type mm. people that got back into it later. And that new breed, and I don't want to like put labels, but the whole like pint night new breed, I do almost think like they're overly concerned sometimes to like, it's almost paralytic. Mm. They're so worried about doing something wrong. It actually stops them from just getting out there and having a good time. So that's, I think that's positive to hear because it was just having the two stories kind of come at me back to back. I was almost like, do I need to do like an integrity and hunting podcast? Because there's certain things that you just I think are assumptions in the industry. Like this is the way we should treat animals and these are the kind of decisions that we should make when we're, when we're out there, but I, it's I, just my bad luck running into a couple of bad stories in the same time maybe, frame. Maybe. And I'm not sure if it's an integrity in hunting sort of thing that needs to be talked about as opposed to just a basic integrity thing, or maybe, you know, social pressure is something that's really yeah. uh, big as well. If people don't realize that, man, I'm not fitting in if I do it like this, this is not socially acceptable within the group that I'm trying to belong to. I'm not saying go out there and, and internet dock them, dox them, <laughs> shame them, whatever it might be. But that education piece about what the standards and norms are, I think is a very important uh, piece of the puzzle. And if we can get um, the new pint nighters, the old school uh, hunters, the bow hunters, the, the truck hunters, the pack hunters to all come in and say, yeah, here's a set of standard rules that we all kind of abide by and it'll work for us in all of our our related pursuits, that would be a good inf information piece, I think. Yeah. I think that social pressure, you kind of nailed it. And I almost forgot to bring that element up because I think that works in both directions because I think there was some social pressure these guys felt to like stack bodies. Like mm. I got to go get, there may have been some filming involved. I got to get some kills. Mm. May have been. Right. I'm, I'm trying to be, yeah, I give, give people some credit. Um, but I think there's social, equal social pressure on the opposite, like a positive social pressure, right. like you're saying. And, you know, the Beyond the Kill guys are good buddies. And I can remember having conversations with them years ago, like two, three, when all these like young sheep were getting killed. And it was like, how do we, as content creators, change the stigma to be like, it is more impressive to come back with a picture of a sheep you chose not to kill because you couldn't confidently age it mm. than making the incentive to be, I don't know, it's borderline, but I got to kill one. Do you know, like, how can we change the social reward system around that so that it's people feel more rewarded, you know, to, to do the right thing in that regards and less... I also think a lot of it is in people's heads. Like, I don't think people are paying as much attention to you online as you think they are. I don't think they are. Yeah. I, I'm surprised, you know, at the num amount of attention that certain posts will get. Yeah. But the reality is, I mean... No, most people don't even know you went hunting unless you're posting about it. 
So if you don't come back with anything, it's not like there's people waiting at the door. You failed, do you mm. know? Like, but I, I think oh, there will be those types. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's for, that's for sure. Um, yeah, I don't want to be negative about it though, because I do think overall hunting is in a better place now in a lot of ways than it's ever been. I think we face a lot of challenges, but I think we're more organized. I think organizations like Howl, um, and I do think there is a more concerted effort on the part of a lot of people I respect to bridge those gaps that you were talking about earlier. Like I'm not a bow hunter, I'm a hunter. I'm not a hunter from Northern BC, I'm a hunter. And and be a more collective, supportive group. I've been talking with some uh, professional educators, high school educators that are, that are into the outdoors, some are into hunting. And, you know, I'm growing more and more to think that this should be an integral part of our education process for mm. elementary school, for high school. And if you look back into the 80s, at one, at one point it was. Right. Like the hunter education program was a part of the high school system. Okay. and Was it really? It was, yeah. Huh. And uh, you can actually pull up a news article. I think it was in the Vancouver Sun. I think it was Jesse Zeman who wrote it because I remember I was talking with Jesse and I'm like, oh, I got this article to show you. And I look at it, I'm like, oh, you wrote it. <laughs> right? And... And it talked about when they pulled hunter education out of the school system and they made core examiners as opposed to having it as a part of the, uh, the sort of credited system. And we lost an over 80% of new hunters when that happened. Oh, for sure. So we've got truth and reconciliation and we've got indigenous studies and part of that is about the land and the usage of land. And I, I see a very strong... Uh, connection that can be used to talk about hunting techniques of the past, social norms. And you know what? If you eat meat, then you should understand the process of life and death and how we all kind of fit into this. And I think that would be a very important thing to bring back in. But there's there's that one piece of that whole hunter education puzzle that we have, at least here in British Columbia, which is the firearms portion, which right. is going to make it really difficult for, for that to be socially acceptable in schools. And we have that firearms portion because when BC came up with its hunter education, they just borrowed from IHEA in, in right. the States. And IHEA doesn't have a firearms program. We didn't even have a firearms training program at the time. When our firearms training program came up, they borrowed from IHEA when it first came out. We're at a point now, at least in Canada, where firearms are done through the RCMP Canadian Firearms Program. And maybe... That's a redundant feature to the BC core program, which can be done away with. Cause it's not like, you know, some people can go through the whole program. They learn about the guns in the core program and never touch a gun cause they're a bow hunter and we don't right. test them on bows. So what if we. Oh, that's interesting. And the reality of it is if you do want to be a rifle hunter, you're going to have to go do um, your pal anyways. Or be under the direct supervision of somebody who which has is the one, like, valid one. Which is going to be pretty rare if you're going to pursue this as a, a real discipline that you're going to spend the rest of your entire hunting career. Like, I don't think that's very practical. But imagine that. Imagine having uh, the survival and the first aid and yeah. the animal identification, bird identification, the ecology, the habitat, and all of these points being part of our our public school system here yeah. in British Columbia, which if somebody so wished afterwards, they could go on and use that for, for hunting. But at the very least, they have exposure and knowledge that, you know, BC's a big place, Canada's a big place. It doesn't all happen in the lower mainland in no. Vancouver and not everyone gets their meat from the corner store. And there are other ways that, um, that we can connect with our environment. Yeah, it's funny. I don't see much of a priority being placed on out outdoors-based education at all. It was funny. I put my daughter in Girl Guides last year. It was actually brownies because she was seven. Mm. And in my recollection, like I did uh, Boy Scouts as a kid. In my recollection, there was like outdoor stuff in Girl Guides. Like she was mm. going to go camping and she's going to learn how to set fire. And like. Now it's zero, what? Sewing and like, cooking and. It, I mean, they do. They kind of went to the local legion and like did arts and crafts once a week for a year. Mm. Like. There was zero, and they had a sleepover, but it was not out in the woods. It was not camping. It was like in, in some type of structure here in town. And I was just like, I was really disappointed because I'm not trying to outsource my kids' outdoors education. I take a lot of pride in the amount of time that we spent outdoors. But I was hoping 
she would start to develop her own personality and maybe meet other friends right. who had similar interests and learn from other people. I don't want to be your sole source of information. I want to be part of this right. community of, of people that you learn from. Um, Why do you and, think that is? Why do you think you don't find that outdoor education part to, well, it sounds like to any extent, but to such an extent in, in an organization like that now? I mean, I'm not going to get all tinfoil hatty, but I think in this movement towards and how do I do this without I, I don't want to exclude people and people are allowed to have whatever beliefs they want but there is this and I'll use the term this movement towards this kind of woke ideology and I don't want to even say that with negative connotation but I almost think that's anything that is associated with a more primal or a, a, a heritage of ancestry is almost looked upon negatively like it's something we're supposed to be moving away from and if it's not camping at a campsite in some manicured place, like it's not something, it, it's almost frowned upon by society. Like I just don't see the same emphasis. Like I'm 45. Everybody camped when I was a kid. And it was, it was like camping wasn't necessarily done in, you know, predetermined places where it had to be done. Mm. And uh, the more... And maybe part of it comes from living in the lower mainland. But like when I talk to parents of other children that go to school with my daughter, I don't know any of them that actually spend time in the outdoors with their kids. And I, I do think as the pendulum is swinging back, it's the same thing as meat eating. Like there now there's, there's actually something morally and ethically wrong with eating meat in the eyes of a large segment of the population. And I think that time in the outdoors gets tied into the meat eating. And I think there's kind of this negative perspective on that type of stuff these days. You know, I, I see the social license to operate the SLO. I hate that term, but you hear it come up over and over again, the social license to operate in the outdoors being something that could be frowned upon by certain groups and types. And, but I also see just the ignorance, which breeds right. fear, yeah. right? I Man, I'm responsible for all these kids and we're going to be outside. What if it rains, right? Yeah. Okay, so they get wet, Yeah. right? What if it gets really bad? Okay, well, then go home. <laughs> right? yeah. It's But that, what if there's a bear and it's going to eat us all, right? I know some people who are afraid to go into our waters because they have a fear of sharks. I know people are afraid to go into the bush because there's going to be a bear around every corner, right? And I think part of that's an exposure thing, but I also see... Um, a trend which I think should be capitalized on because um, it's a positive thing of mental health. Right. And there's, That's great. And that came up during COVID as well. Right. And that's going to be something that people are starting to realize that we are not isolated from each other. Yeah. We're not isolated from our environment. The simple fact of the matter is it's not about the animals and us. It's about us. We are an animal and we work in this system and if we divorce ourselves from that thinking, we're going to have related problems. And one of them that's manifesting itself is this whole disconnection from nature and mental health issues. Right. I think that's a trend that should be pursued aggressively for the health benefits of, of everybody as well. It helps normalize the hunting process and at least puts it on the radar of those who might say, I'm not into it, but I get there's a connection with nature and all, all the rest and how healthy that is. This is a very interesting insight you bring up that I'd like to delve into a little bit deeper. And you talked about the isolation between humans and nature. Mm. And I do think there is a somewhat prevalent opinion these days that like our job is to like leave that stuff over there alone and try and let it get back to what it was before we messed it up. Mm. Whereas, you know, like with the, for example, with the North American model of conservation, it's always been approached like they're here, we're here, we need to find a way to like make this mesh sure. and we can use, you know, hunting as a wildlife management tool, for example, in order to help manage populations and other things. But I do see, I do see, you know, if you look at how dramatic all that stuff is going on in Colorado right now, if you look at the approach to grizzlies that... BC has taken even some of this caribou stuff that went on last year. I do feel that there is this, as opposed to looking at it, like we are natural, we're human beings. We live here. We're going to interface with nature. We need to find a way 
to make that interface work long term in the in the interest of all the parties, the animals, the environment, um, human beings. It, there is more of like this separation occurring. We're like we're supposed to stay over here, and you're not allowed to go over there and um, influence that. We're supposed to let it try and and get back to some untouched state. Well, the fact that we want to see our caribou population flourish. We want to see our, our animals doing well. Yep. Um, we have a decision to make. Do we give everything back to the animals and we just, I don't know, <laughs> go <laughs> go somewhere, some concrete area that's never going to... Or do we realize that there is a way for us to work with them and harmoniously with our environment and we don't just concrete everything over. We can build our buildings in such a way and our parks in such a way that it's going to be conducive to animals being able to flow through and we can find sort of a symbiotic relationship because in the way that we look at animals having a right, we have a right as well. And yep. I'm not going to be stronger than the bear. I'm not going to be faster than the deer, but I've got a way of thinking that's going to be able to exceed how these animals can think in certain ways. So that's what I have to be able to use in order to find a way to to work together with it. And it's... Um, there's a lot of emotion tied up into these things. Like when we talk about the grizzly bear hunt, yep. uh, politics obviously take a role. And when we take a look at what politics are, like, I mean, I remember years ago in Delta, they're looking at saying no more fire firearms businesses in Delta. And I'm like, ah, oh, this isn't right. I'm not, I don't agree with this. Uh, the local gun store there said, this is fantastic because I'm retiring and <laughs> think about how much extra value my, my grandfather's location is going to have. Right, and right, right. Great guy, but I didn't see eye to eye on, with him on that one. I told him that. Um, but I, I remember I sat down in just the sort of like small political spectrum of Delta there, given my two bits and I'm into it. And finally, uh, I think it was, uh, Barry stands up and says, Trav, like how much more of this do you have? Right. And I said, oh, I got all these pages. He says, Trav, I'm going to stop you. I agree. I agree a hundred percent with everything you're saying. hundred percent. I said, oh, well then why are we even here? Right. He says, cause it's got nothing to do with what makes sense. It's got everything to do with what we think the people want. Right. And that was an eye opener for me. Yeah. It's got to do with what the people want. And, you know, I think the people's wants can be a very good thing, but it can also be manipulated or misguided. Yeah. I want the animals to do well. Fantastic. Everybody does, right? The bird watchers want to see the birds do well and see plenty of them in there. The hunters who will be going home with the birds want to see the bird population doing well and have plenty of them in there. We're on common ground there. It's how we take that next step forward to manage and work together, which I think gets convoluted. And so if we can educate things, people in such a way that we're both moving towards, we're in the river, we're going down, we've got a public consciousness, and we're able to direct our ship or raft or whatever it might be down that river in the same way, I think that's where our effort should be going. Not putting our hands up against the stream and saying, "Yeah, we're right, you're wrong, and we're going to start moving because that's that's a losing proposition. That's another really interesting point. And I, I've talked about this on the podcast before, so I don't want to belabor it, but I did this project in, in part of my other career as a, as a consultant for uh, One Campfire. Right. whose kind of mandate is to impact sentiment of non-hunters. I think a lot of organizations are focused around getting new hunters. Mm. But if you look at our numbers, even if we doubled, which is never going to happen, we're still not a significant percentage of the voting base. But the idea that there's, I like to call them fence sitters. Mm. There's a whole lot of people out there who don't feel strongly about hunters one way or another. And they're going to be swayed by kind of whatever piece of persuasive information they're exposed to positively or negatively. And we kind of coined the term for a, a particular target group of outdoor enthusiasts, non-hunting outdoor enthusiasts. So these would be rock climbers, mountain bikers, uh, backcountry campers, through hikers, mm. because the theory was there's a lot of alignment between those people and hunters. We care about, like if we took the two Venn diagrams of the things hunters care about and the things rock climbers and mountain hunt climbers, um, mountain bikers care about, there's a lot of overlap there. Like wild places and freedom and the ability to explore and solitude and all that kind of stuff. Just so happens we also like to hunt animals while we're out there. But if you look at the things that we need to do to make sure our interests are protected, they're actually deeply aligned with what they need to do. 
And so the idea was, well, how can we shift sentiment positively in that group? So I'd like to bring our conversation back to some more practical tactics, actually, so that the listener actually has something to go away with. Because I think your your position at the interface of the kind of long-term hunting population and the, the new breed of, of hunter gives you some interesting insights. One of the things I try to do is I give away a lot of meat. Mm. I actually make a ton of sausage because a lot of wild game isn't the easiest thing in the world to cook. And so I make a ton of sausage because everybody likes sausage. And I, I give it away to lots of people like at the gym, parents at my kid's school. And the idea is like, you know me, you know, I'm like a reasonable dude, right? Yeah. <laughs> But now you also know I'm a hunter. So the idea is now you as a non-hunter have this personal relationship with somebody that you have a pretty positive feeling about. So the next time you're at a party and somebody brings up hunters, you think to yourself, well, I know that one dude. He's not a bad guy. He's not running around, you know, drinking beers in the back of a pickup truck and, and treating the environment with disdain. He, you know, is a respectful individual who likes adventure in the outdoors. So... What are some things you think we can do? And you already mentioned kind of more mentorship and, and, and coming with a more teaching philosophy when we run into newer people, but also when we're in those situations with the non-hunting population, what are some things you think we can do in order to create more favorable sentiment around hunters and hunting in general? That's funny. Cause when you first started talking there, I was like, Oh, I got a question for him with one campfire. Like how, how do you successfully influence uh, non-hunter sentiment and well, ha has one campfire been successful and I, I will answer your question but that was just my the tangent How, do you do you feel that it's hitting the numbers that it should be hitting i want i i'm or that you want it to be hitting one campfire has the potential okay. to have some great impact have they hit all the notes i don't think they have quite yet but it's also like a lot of other not-for-profit organizations, they don't have infinite budgets and resources. And I think with what they've had at their disposal, and I think there's been some shifts mm. in personnel, and I think I feel better about the direction they're going now than I ever have before. But I think there's still room for improvement. So my first thoughts on this as I'm thinking through, and as you gave me that little bit of a, a thinking space there, um, you pick your audience. I would say, number one, I'm not going to convince a non-hunter who's adamantly against hunting. Yeah. And they're entitled to their opinion. Just like I'm not going to convince a firearms person who's been negatively affected by firearms how great guns are. It's, there's so much emotion that's tied up into that. It, far be it from me to say, this is, this is what you should be thinking. However, if I'm able to tell the story or show mm. the end result, which is like you say, your meat diplomacy as you're going around, that's yep. part of the end result. They're like, Hey, I really like this. Right. Yeah. Some people might say like, I remember when I was in grade four, I think it was grade five. I won the award for the smelliest sandwiches. Cause I kept having bear meat sandwiches. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, some people might like, Oh, what is this stuff that they're, yeah. <laughs> that they're feeding me, but pick your, pick your audience that you're going to, don't try to convince anybody of anything. Right. The more you stand up on a soapbox and you're like, this is great, this is right, and this is all the reasons. You're not even saying you're wrong. You're just saying, I'm right for A, B, and C. But you're able to enjoy what you do in a positive way. Be passionate about what you do. And then be curate, let's say, your social media feed or the parts that you talk about in a way that a non-hunters might understand. Because if you're talking about um, the, the actual act of shooting an animal, which is just like that, a fraction of a second, yeah. which is so small, or you're talking about things that might be putting them off, or you're talking about, man, I spent, I spent, um, uh, a year researching the environment. I spent a, this amount of time getting myself physically prepared. Here's some of the positive benefits that I've had. Here's the connections I've made within this community over there. And yeah. they invited me into, and here's these things I learned. There's an adventure there that I think yeah. people, there's not only an adventure, but also a connection. There's a connection to nature. There's a connection to others that I think people are sorely missing in this yeah. ever connected environment that we live in. We couldn't be more distant. Now you've done that a couple times. I got something. I think face. I was just itchy. Okay. I saw you do that after I did. I'm like, I think he thinks I told him there was stuff in his beard. Oh, no, I, totally I was. Do. I was literally itchy. No, your beard is, 
It's beautiful, man. It's, it's beautiful. Thick and lush. <laughs> I'm just on my way back, so I'm feeling a little uh, beard inferiority complex over here. And I was like, oh, I got something on my beard. No, it's magnificent. But yeah, so we pick our audiences. We don't try and convince other people. Yes. We look at what our end goal is that we're moving towards, and we put our blinders on, I think. Like, it's okay to look around left or right, and you can see the haters, but the more attention I give them, in the same way if everyone's loving me, I I can't give them that attention either, because if they're going to say, oh, you're awesome, you're great, Jay, I love your podcast, I love your reviews, and put you all all up here, then you're going to end up putting the same amount of energy into the the negative as well when they come around and, like, I really disagree agree with A, B, and C. So we put our blinders on, we move towards a worthy ideal, and we do so in a way that's sharing our passion and sharing our positivity. And that's actually why I started the Silver Core Podcast. Right. Because I was experiencing so much negativity yeah. in the industry, and I was like, you know, is it worth it? And I regrouped and I said, let me see if I can change the change the industry, even if it's just a little bit, or maybe change my perspective and the people that I surround myself with. And the more you do that, the more you start, I think, moving things in the same way the meat eaters done it. You, you start normalizing activities, which are normal. Yeah. I love that. And I think it goes right into this thought I was, I was having, I think everybody's into these grand gestures these days and everybody think, and listen, don't get me wrong. Go join Goat Alliance and do a, a goat count or BHA and, and do a pint night or like big things. That's great. But I almost think people tend to undervalue just the one-on-one conversations. Mm. And I almost think that to some degree is more important. Like if more of us were like, yeah, at your kid's birthday party and it comes up and I love you talking about the stories. Cause I find when it comes up, I just got back from some crazy solo sheep hunt. Like hunting is like third or fourth down the list of things they're actually hearing. Sure. They're hearing about this crazy adventure to this super cool place, about something they would never dream of going and doing. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't even have to be that insane. Like, I think most of the weekend trips, hunters go on to some remote spots in in British Columbia, or even driving to Hope and going down some logging roads is more remote than most of the people in the lower mainland are going to get, you know, in the next few years. Sure. And I think having those one-on-one connections and relationships and just putting like a face to the group, you know, Mm -hmm. like I'm a normal person. I care about stuff. I hunt. Here's some of the cool stuff I do. I really do think that can have a, a a larger impact on how society as a whole, you know, treats hunting and feels about it. And I think you nailed an important piece here as well, which is I'm a normal person, right? Right. Be a normal person, right? Actually care about what other people have to say. You don't have to agree if they're standing up and down and saying, I hate hunting or right, whatever for A, B, and C, but it's good to understand, be open to and think about it. And then if they want to ask my opinion, after I've considered all those facts, like there's sometimes people will say something that, you know, the, the knee jerk reaction would be pretty obvious from anybody in the hunting or firearms community, but I'll sit there and I'll listen. And I'll say, I can see where you're coming from. Yeah. I can appreciate where you're coming from. doesn't mean I agree with where they're coming from, but I can appreciate it. Yep. And I think it changes it from an us against them to, um, to more of a conversation that people can have and realize that, okay, I guess I can change. I don't have to be drawing my line in the sand and defending my position. This individual understands what I'm saying. And maybe I'm going to take a little bit of time to try and understand where they're coming from. Right. No, I think that's important. So let's, let's bring it back to the personal a little bit, because, you know, you mentioned earlier going to Hawaii. Um, Where are you at in your hunting evolution these days like what are the types of hunts that really get you fired up and what what does that bring into your life probably different than it's going to be different for everybody of course right but when you take a look at people who are in the social media sphere who are hunting and showing successful hunts over and over again i'm lucky that i've been successful on a good number of my hunts i don't know if you see any of that on my social media right what do I like when I'm hunting? I like that personal connection with the people that I'm going up with. Yeah. I, I love to hunt with my family, with my wife and my kids. Um, How old are your kids? 14 and 16. Okay. Boys, girls? Uh, eldest is a girl. Youngest is a boy. Okay. Uh, eldest, she wants, she dances basically every single day, wants to be a doctor, gets straight A's, and I don't know where she gets 
all of that from, but right. very different from how I was in high school. Okay. Young, youngest does Muay Thai and cadets and flies Cessna airplanes. And, wow. Yeah. So um, you've done well, my friend. Well, it's not me; it's them. Yeah. Right. So, well, um, I, I appreciate the humility, but yes, I mean, good job. But um, you know, they they've got different ambitions and different goals that they they like to see forward. Of course. And if I can spend some time just being outside, I don't yeah. care if it's just sitting and waiting and watching the animals go by. Right. Yeah. So, that is what gets me most excited. Okay. Uh, running the business can have me locked down to a certain degree within the business and all the positives and negatives and everything that goes with it. So it also provides me an opportunity to, um, and a good excuse, get outside. I'm outside a cell phone range. So, yeah. you know, we've done a few fly-in hunts and fishes and enjoy those, uh, you know, done, took, uh, I had a whitewater raft I got after I almost drowned for the, I think the third time and, uh, got a proper raft and. I took that a hundred kilometers down the Fraser and just like those adventures are fun or go up to the Yukon and taking a little 16 foot, 60 horsepower, two stroke outboard loaded up to the gunnels for a couple hours down Teslin and uh, hunting for moose and just you're out there. Yeah. And that's, that's what drives me having, we need adversity in our life. We need positive yes. adversity. Yes. We need challenges in a way that, uh, push us as individuals and all of these things can have the opportunity to push us in ways that we wouldn't get otherwise. So it creates an environment which you, and people say, well, were you successful? I mean, I'm back here. I had a great time. Yeah, I'm successful. And that's how I gauge all of my hunts. Great. So whether I get an animal, I don't get an animal was success, successful, man, hundred percent. And I haven't had a hunt yet, which hasn't been successful. So from that perspective. I like that perspective. One of the things I'm trying to work on more is the fellowship component. Mm -hmm. A big push for me when I first got into backcountry hunting was the solo aspect. Like I liked this idea of this, like, you know, I'm going to go conquer the mountains by myself kind mm -hmm. of thing. I've been very fortunate to go some really cool places and do some really cool things. Mm -hmm. um, but I have noticed that like building those relationships and People always think the solo thing is harder. And I think in a lot of ways I do the solo thing because it's easier. There's no compromises to be made. Sure. I wake up, I go where I want to go. I do what I want to do. And I think that might be as, as a, as a diehard introvert with social anxiety, I think the idea of like meeting other people and spending time with a lot of other people, I find that more challenging than the idea of, of being alone. Mm. Um, but I have several um, partner hunts on the calendar this year. And when I was kind of booking things out, it was like, that was one of my big priorities because I was like, this is lacking in my hunting. Mm. And I, yes, I love being out there and I love being by myself and I love that particular challenge. But I almost think there, I was listening to Andrew Huberman the other day and I try not to go too far down that rabbit hole, <laughs> but he was saying there's a difference between hard things you want to do and hard things you don't want to do okay. in their ability to develop you. So there's this part of our brain that I guess when we do hard things we don't want to do, it gets bigger and sure. it gives us more discipline and a greater ability to go do other stuff. Mm -hmm. But as soon as we kind of want to do those, like going to the gym, I love going to the gym. Sure. Now it's hard. I, I have to exercise a certain amount of discipline to make myself go every day. And then you I have to, to be there. That's the thing. And his argument is that's not really contributing anymore to like, growing that part of your brain that's going to get you got to find stuff you don't want to do that you also find hard and i got thinking about that and i'm like that's that fellowship like that's uncomfortably hard for me um and th that that's a very difficult part too because not everyone's going to hunt the same way yeah and if you're spending an extended period of time under pressure and stress and people having different ambitions <sighs> in different areas like you got to pick these people very carefully. Yes, you do. But you can still go out and do your solo thing throughout the day. You can regroup at night. You yep. can have a little talk and you can be like, okay, that's enough time with these people. I'm going to hit the tent now, right? Um, you can still have all of that. It's uh, like for me, by and large, there's, there's a, a very small handful of people that I truly enjoy going outside yeah. and spending time like that with. My family obviously fits that bill and then I've got a few friends. But 
it's interesting that you mention the anxiety, social anxiety, introvert, like talking with Mark Kenyon, talking like with uh, Brad Brooks, we were talking about him earlier. Yeah. And a, a number of these people who put their face out there in the industry as um, essentially as targets, right? Yeah. Like, like you do, you put yourself out there in, in, in a way on social media and through the podcast, you're very, you're out there. Yeah. A huge number of these people would I self-identify as introverts, which yeah. I thought was really interesting. I don't know if you've experienced that, but... So I have some thoughts on this. Yeah. Because the other thing was, it was I mentioned before the podcast, I was a DJ and a music producer for 10 right. years. And when I used to mention that, like, also, if, if somebody meets me, like, you know, this is the first time we've actually sat down and had a conversation. If I hadn't have brought that up and you left and someone asked you a survey five minutes ago, would you think Jay is an introvert or an extrovert? You would probably say extrovert based on how I behave. I agree. Ditto. Yeah. Now... People always want to know, well, how are you a, a a DJ when you're so introverted? I was also a business consultant. I'm used to being in rooms with 50, 60 people and running through, through exercises, getting very aggressive with C-suites of large mm -hmm. corporations. For me, it has come down to role awareness. An introvert isn't necessarily uncomfortable being around people. You're uncomfortable being around people when you don't know what you're supposed to do. It drains you. One way I've heard about yeah. it is... An introvert will spend time in a group and they'll do well, yep. but they'll leave drained. 100%. An extro extrovert will be fueled up and charged after that interaction. Yep. I also prefer fewer, deeper connections over multiple 100%. shallower. Like I like this. Sure. I'm going to get to know Travis. We're going to sit down. We're going to have a deep conversation. We're going to be open. We're going to be a little vulnerable. We're going to share things about ourselves the idea of like a networking event like those pint night things give me the heebie-jeebies i i think they're great if that's your bag but the idea of just walking into a room full of people i've never met before i just dis i i hate it i clam up which is like it but but you're not you're not able like we wear masks all the time all the time we're wearing the dad mask we're wearing the boss mask we're wearing the whatever it might be you're wearing, you're, you're doing those roles and i don't think anybody is truly maskless ever because they might not know you're always evolving and always yes. changing but when you're in a group environment like that especially for an introvert it's a process of um working to the group i would say that, yeah. that can be difficult but one-on-one -on -one, it's okay we're navigating this we're feeling where we can be vulnerable where we can't in the group thing it's just it's high level and i don't yeah. feel that connection no agreed and i also think podcasting and content creation, much like the DJing, there's like this barrier between you and the world. Like most people are doing Zoom interviews or they're doing, Kenyon does a lot of stuff I do like solo, you know, more tactic and, and gear based uh, podcasts. And I think it can be you putting stuff out, mm. but there's, it's like a one way form of communication, which I think is much more comfortable for the introvert. Like here's an example. So wild sheep society has their show coming up. They asked me to do a seminar on solo hunting and I immediately had this like panic attack <laughs> a, because I have a little bit of an, of a imposter syndrome and I'm like, good, you should, what right do I have to sit in a room full of sheep hunters and tell them how to go into the mountain and kill a sheep. And then I thought to myself, well, Watch Sheep Society didn't ask you to give a seminar on solo sheep killing. Mm. They asked you to give a seminar on solo hunting. Mm -hmm. And so I started thinking to myself, listen, you know, I was a forestry engineer for 15 years. Like if there's one thing I know how to do, I can go into the mountains, I can get from A to B, and I can get back out. Mm. And I've made my fair share of mistakes. I've learned from those mistakes. I'm not ashamed to share those mistakes. But I feel very confident in those mountaineering abilities sure but then when i thought about being around all those people and they're like we're having an ex exhibition booth or an exhibition you could get a booth for mindful hunter if you want and like <laughs> the more this conversation is proceeding with them like the more sweaty my palms are getting because mm. it's like now i'm delivering a seminar now i'm doing this but going back to um this thing huberman said and also I do feel somewhat of a responsibility. Like when you build an audience and you start to tell people like, listen, there's things that I can share that are going to help you. I also start to feel like a responsibility of, with that relationship. And uh, like, there's lots of guys in BC that would love a chance to like, let's go grab a steak on the Friday night or come up to the booth and shake my hand and just introduce themselves. Maybe show me some pictures from a hunt they went on. And I was like, I'm coming up with more, 
good reasons that I should be doing this, not for my own personal development or business development, but also for the people that I try and connect with online, then I can come up with negative reasons telling me not to do it. Yeah. Well, I, and I get it. Yeah, I can be, you said imposter syndrome and I said, good. Yeah. I think everybody should be feeling imposter syndrome right. because if you're not, you're not pushing yourself. That's the whole process yeah, of moving like from that. where you are now to, to a new place right, that right. May, maybe you want to be, but until you get there, you won't really know. So let's, let's push it a bit. I think everybody should always be pushing themselves to a point where they're feeling at least a little bit of imposter syndrome. Right. You're not going to go out there and lie. You're not going to be an imposter. That is a very different uh, thing. And I think the uh, the honesty of the endeavor, the honesty of the experience, the honesty of the successes and failures that a person has seen qualified with, this is how it worked for me and within this time and all the rest, allows people to uh, make their own determination as to whether the information you're going to provide is going to be worthwhile to them because maybe they're in the same boots as you. Like we're talking about literally boots. Yeah. You, you recommend these boots and the same foot shape. Fantastic. Right. The, the, and yeah, pushing yourself in those situations, I think is important. Ensuring that you're not, uh, lying about things. That's where I was going to go with it. Uh, that's what Mark Kenyon said. Right. It, Mark Kenyon said, you know, I had, a lot of pressure to be this superhero type hunter yeah. because of my position and where I was at. And man, it just didn't feel like me. And the second I started showing my failures and yeah. showing areas where I messed up, not only did I feel a lot better because this is me, but I got a heck of a lot more people following me yeah. because now you're relatable. hundred percent, man. I was having this conversation with James Yates the other day and I said, I was very lucky early on that I realized my niche was adventure hunting. Mm. I kind of took a lot of pressure off of myself. Like I know how to go crazy places and come back in one piece. I don't always kill stuff when I'm out there. I think I have a long way to go in that particular skill development, but it meant I could make really cool films and I could still share really cool stories. And it, it's surprising I think it actually has a bigger impact on people. Mm. Like I think people are actually more expired and more relate to that than like, listen, I love Ryan Lampers, but like he might as well be Zeus. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> come on, man. I don't, I, I, I will never be, I can't imagine a future in which I'm Ryan Lampers. Mm. Maybe there is one, but like, I just don't see it. You know what I mean? But I can think of other people who are one or two steps ahead of me that are, relatable and achievable. And it was so funny. You talked about almost this gap between the current and ideal state mm. and the fact that there's always going to be a little bit of cognitive dissonance there. Like, do I deserve to be here? Do I deserve to be heading there? So I'm launching this new brand on, on, on Monday. I'm building everything out for it. I'm getting everything going. And I'm like kind of having some trouble going to sleep at night and experiencing this doubt about it. And I thought to myself yesterday, I, th I think if you're not experiencing s doubt of some kind, you're not pushing yourself hard enough. Have you talked publicly about this brand in the past or is it going to be a, a launch surprise? So the, the, it's called Forged in the Backcountry. Nobody actually knows what it is yet. I've, I've posted the teaser pic on my Instagram. Everybody knows that it's launching on, well, it depends. It'll probably already be launched by the time this podcast, mm. um, comes out in fact it definitely will be okay. um so that's funny enough we could probably actually talk about it but yeah. no people aren't aware of what the brand is do you want to talk about it and uh, you can edit it out if you don't like it well let's let, let's do it okay um so i'm going to tell some context first before i get into what it actually is so this goes back to the wild sheep society saying can you come do this seminar and then i was like okay i'm gonna have a booth and i'm like well you gotta have merch Mm. Every booth needs to have some merch. I've done merch before, like simple t-shirts and hats and some embroidery and stuff. And then I started thinking like, I come from a design and creative background. I'm like, I want to do something a little more interesting. And I start playing around with some designs and concepts. And then I realize there's a hole in the industry. If you want to wear something that proclaims and signals, I'm a backcountry hunter. I like hunting. You really have two choices some type of logo wear mm. from a company mm. or some type of influencer merch. 
You sure. could wear a born and raised outdoors hat. You could wear a Sitka t-shirt. Still you logo wear. hundred percent. Yeah. But there's no lifestyle apparel brands in the backcountry hunting industry, like a Supreme for backcountry hunters. If you think of hip hop, that's kind of where I come up from my background with DJing. You've got like LRG, Obey, Supreme, OGO, like all of these lifestyle brands that aren't affiliated. OGO is a luggage equipment, so that was a, that was a bad example. But you have all of these brands that aren't affiliated with products themselves. Their whole idea is to create um, apparel that speaks to like the ethos of a community. And so I started thinking more about it. And the, the way the name came up is that I was trying to come up with this t-shirt for Mindful Hunter. And I the phrase forged in the backcountry mm. kept coming into my mind. You know, I did that podcast on sobering up. We kind of had a couple conversations online after that. And I honestly feel that like my time in the backcountry and the kind of lessons that I learned in the backcountry and the challenges that I went helped transition me between those two phases in my life. Cause I felt a little lost. Like I didn't know where I belonged and I almost feel to some degree I was forged in the backcountry through those challenges. So the whole idea is lifestyle apparel. The other thing is that a lot of influencer merch and logo wear all tends to be the same schmedium, you know, t-shirts with tight sleeves and not the highest quality of, of merch. And it's more created for marketing mm-hmm. than lifestyle apparel. So the idea was I want to source high quality clothes. I want to do all the designs in house. I bought all the equipment. It's actually sitting on the floor over there. I do all the printing. The printing is done out of house, but like the the putting of the designs and the actual manufacture of the designs on the shirts is all done in house. So I'll be launching on Monday. It will be keeping things simple. There's going to be two t-shirts, a hoodie, a flannel, and a couple hats. Mm. And they're kind of built around kind of aspirational sayings and text and imagery, but done in like a stylish way on very nice clothes. Mm. So that's forged in the backcountry. Interesting. It's kind of like um, on Oahu. I think it's Oahu. They have that. I For the longest time, I thought it was called Hetty. Okay. H-E and the, the greater than symbol and I. Yes. Which is he greater than I. And it's a, I guess it would say, religious background behind it. But it's it doesn't talk about religion. It doesn't talk about. And it's for people to say, oh, hey, I'm, I, I have, there's a, there's just a being or source that's greater than me out there, and I don't want to identify with that. Right. So more of an identification thing as opposed to this is, I am name brand Sitka, Kuyu, whatever. Well, because there's always a tribalism to that. Mm. And I've gone through times when like, you know, I didn't, like I used to support a particular gear company and then now I don't because maybe, maybe there was just, they did something that I didn't agree with. And it's like, so I got eight kind of t-shirts from one company in my, <laughs> and it's also like in BC, it's tough because people assume things like if you go to Northern BC, it's like a pretty diehard Kuyu community in mm. a lot of ways. And you show up in Sitka and then there's like all this weird knit. And it's like, are you, are we serious right now? Like yeah. I could give a shit what type of camo you wear, but you talked about clicks and yeah. kind of inter, you know, groups in, within a community. I think this is, if there's one thing I found out doing gear reviews, it's like, do not say if somebody's a Swaro guy and you bash Swaro on a gear review, people lose their minds. Like people feel very emotionally attached to the brands that they buy from. And I think we need a way to signal. I love backcountry hunting without signaling I buy Sitka or signaling I buy Kuyu. So you're um, essentially, you're essentially branding an ethos. A hundred percent. So people can. That you know, challenge, that's the ethos, the forge. They're like, I like to go hard places and do hard things. Now this hard place and hard thing happens to be hunting, mm. but that's, that's the common factor is that it, you know, in my mind, I see this community that all relates to this brand and that community is built of people who like to go hard places and do hard things like you were talking about earlier for personal development and a variety of other reasons. And that could, 
uh, be greater than just hunting as well. Theoretically, yeah. Now, I've always been from like a marketing and business strategy perspective. I think you need to dial down, like most people try and go wider. Identify your market. A hundred percent. And so I'm a hunter. I know hunters. I feel like after doing this for so long, I feel very strongly there's a group of people just like me that live in places like the lower mainland. I think this is one of the reasons for Stone Glacier's popularity. Mm. You can't wear the Sitka Core Light uh, hoodie in Optifade uh, out to dinner with your wife. Mm. You can wear the Stone Glacier Avro hoodie. Mm. You might as well be wearing Lululemon. Sure. Nobody knows, but you know, and that guy across the restaurant who sees the Ram logo, he knows. Yep. You know, like there's this signaling that goes on to people in the know. And I think... I mean, Kurt knew what he was doing when he decided to steer clear of, of camos. And I think that speaks to that same ethos. So a friend of mine is a uh, head of hunter education and firearms training in the Bavarian region. Okay. And he talks about the whole camo thing as well. And he says, you know, North America, not a problem. You guys got your camos, everything else. He says, I don't have anything against it. I see the value, but there's a public perception when the... Yeah. When we're out there in a in an area that's going to be a bit more populated, and the dog walker is out there, and they see a person with their firearm and decked out in camouflage, it sends a very different message than the person who's maybe wearing their traditional loading or wearing yeah, uh, sub- all raven, yeah, their subdued colors, and yep. uh, um, and maybe maybe not at all tactical out firearm that you, that they're using. And there's one side that says, forget it, be proud, wear your camera, normalize it, get it out there. Fantastic. We need that voice, right? I think that's an important thing that uh, we need. But there's also the ones that would say, show, maybe you're the the gateway (laughs) to drug to the outdoors and hunting that somebody who might be on the fence or might not quite be there can relate with. They're like, hey, I I like Fiel Riven and I... Geez, that's a classy looking firearm you have there. So we, we need all types of these. I'm not going to poop on one over the other, but that interesting European philosophy of let's let's send a, a message to everybody else looking at us that is not going to be intimidating. That's, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and, and further to the initial point. So as I go through this and, you know, everything I've done has always been very much me. So it's like you, when, if you're having doubts, you know, when I put out a review, I feel a level of anxiety because mm. I'm kind of, it reminds me when I used to write music and you release a song there, you feel this level of anxiety because it's not just, you cannot take away the attachment between the thing you created and your own personality. Mm. There will always be this. If you don't like my review, you don't like me. Mm. That's not real but it kind of feels like that. Mm -hmm. And so when you're creating product and I'm going through all these designs and I'm like, there's this doubt and this anxiety, like, am I right? Did I come up with the right idea? I know I like this stuff. Is anybody else going to like this stuff? And I do feel if I didn't feel any of that, I don't think what I would was, I don't think it'd be any good. So would you be producing all the content or would you license the um, sort of like Gore Optifade, like Guy Kramer, made Gore Optifate and he yep. does the uh, camouflages all over the world for different armies um, and not, you know, some people can use it all to themselves. He's made it for them. Other people will license it out. Would you have an ethos and a, a something that you're looking at building that other companies could then make their, their subdivision line of? Is that something that you're thinking? Or? I think I've always felt a very strong responsibility about the communication between my brands and my audience. Mm. And like with mindful reviews, for example, the thoughts cross my mind. What if somebody wanted to buy me one day and I, I think, or bring me on, you know, I've mm. thought about that. There's other in- companies that would like mindful reviews would kind of like fit in, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like certain e-commerce sure. brands, it would be a, you know, from a strategic perspective, it would make a lot of sense. Mm. And I think one of the one of the areas where I kind of put my foot down early on was this unbiased, non-sponsored, heavily based in integrity. Mm-hmm. And I think as soon as you create a distance between yourself and the end product you, that you the consumer, that you lose it. Yeah. And I, I don't understand. I, I don't think most people would understand how many sleepless nights I've had when it comes to that. Like. Mm. I take the relationship I have with the people who consume, like there are people who spend multiple thousands of dollars on gear based to a large degree on what I've said. Mm -hmm. And I do not 
take that lightly. And I feel the same way about the clothing brand. Like if I'm telling you that this represents who I am as a hunter and it's what I believe, then I don't think I would ever want to be in a position where other people would be putting stuff out and kind of capitalizing Mm. on that integrity that I've built. I'd rather be small. So now I'd like to bring some other, you know, I just started a joint podcast with Pat Van Winkle because he aligns very strongly with the way I look at gear, with the way I look at sponsorships, but he has this whole other skill set that I just don't have in long range shooting and ballistics and all Mm. this other stuff. Now, as the brand grows, if there was other individuals who were deeply aligned and wanted to come on Mm. and help grow things, that's something I'm, I'm interested in doing. But I think the idea of like building something to sell it, I see it happen. I see it happen too much and they lose the essence of, of what they are. So what is the ultimate goal of the brand? Would it be for uh, money? Would it be for spreading an ethos? Is it to try and affect social change? It'd be just from an interesting standpoint, obviously having money is important because that will affect other, other goals that go in and makes it replicable and, and expandable so we can grow it. I think the number one problem, you know, there's this, there's this saying when you're developing business ideas, the difference between a pain pill and a vitamin. Mm. You want to be a pain pill, not a vitamin because people have to buy Tylenol. They don't have to buy vitamin D. Mm. Um, and the pain pill in this for me was well-fitting clothing that's stylish and speaks to my belief system. Mm. It doesn't currently exist in this particular market. So my ultimate goal is to create that so that people like me have a place to go to buy clothes like that. Obviously I want to be financially profitable and I want to, and I want to grow it, but I almost see it as more of an, an impact thing. Like I can say this now. So when I launch, I'm going to be running a promotion where every $5 spent will get you one entry into a guided black bear hunt in BC. Cool. So I bought two black bear hunts cash. Mm. The idea is you'll go with me. You just got to get yourself to Vancouver. I take care of everything else. Mm. We're going to go up to primitive outfitting outside of Prince George. We'll spend the whole week together. We're going to hunt together. Me killing something is far secondary. I'm not going to touch a weapon until the person that I go with is successful. I'm going to film the whole thing. And it's like, as the brand grows, I actually see more. I'd like to do some group trips. I would like to sponsor things. I would like it to be big enough that I could like, you know, help sponsor like a WSSBC show or like a TAC event. Or, Cause we don't have anything like that in, Very we cool. don't have a big archery thing. Like I would like, I would like forged to be that force that focuses on helping. And I, I get, I don't want to be too, like, I keep saying backcountry hunter. I don't want to ignore all hunters are always welcome. Mm. But I do think like when you go into Cabela's, there's stuff for those other guys that kind of speaks to what they do. I don't see the same options available for the backcountry hunter. So I'm not trying to be exclusive. I'm trying to give a, a group of people who I don't really feel like has a voice this way to do it. But that would be more my priority is like this aspirational. I want to create opportunities for cool people to do cool shit and have the courage to go do things that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise. I'm pretty excited to see how this one rolls out. That sounds good. And who knows, maybe this will get cut from the podcast. Maybe that'll be in there, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm really excited to see. I get excited watching other people build businesses, build endeavors, build their, uh, their own exciting passions like that that gets me fueled up. So I'm, uh, I'm excited for you. So we're kind of wrapping up near the end here, but what I would like to transition to on that note of kind of business and development and self-actualization, where do you see silver core moving into the future? Like, do you have some cool stuff on the horizon? And I would ask the same thing to you. Like what gets you out of bed in the morning when it comes to, to silver core? Is it growing? Is it money? Is there some type of impact or community element? Uh, nearly all of the above. Um, you know, and I've said this before on my podcast, it's never the money, right? If I make money, my goal that I'm trying to work towards, I'm always going to be behind it. Right. If I make quality product, quality service, um, the, the best possible production I can put out, 
my goal, money will be a natural byproduct of all the hard work and effort that goes into it. It's like, you know, high school, kids trying to be popular. The ones you try to be popular are never popular. Right. They're always behind it, right? So work on what drives you and fuels you. And for me, it, it's a creation process. I like building systems. I like building processes. I like learning new things. I'm, I'm not the person. I had the opportunity to uh, purchase lever arms from Alan Lever back in the day. I had the opportunity to uh, get in with Hunter Sporting Goods when it was around. I helped an individual get that one, but I'm not the personality type to sit behind a counter and and uh, do that day in, day out. I, I need change and adversity and uh, adventures. So that's what gets me out of bed is what's the new thing I can learn? How can I share my passion with others? How, how can I surround myself with other people who are positive and better than me, essentially? Right. So yeah. those are the I things. I like that part. Yeah, it, th those are the things that really kind of get me excited. Once I build something, I enjoy making processes, putting things in place, but the management of all of that, you know, everyone that I have on a staff, I tell them the same thing. I mean, if you're looking for somebody to sit over your shoulder and tell you what to do all day long, you're going to be sorely disappointed, right? I, I follow the George Patton approach of don't tell somebody how to do something, tell them what you'd like to see accomplished and let them surprise you with the results. So that takes a certain type of individual who's self-starting and motivated and they're, they always know that they can come with questions, but, and help's always available. But the perfect world is we learn from each one of those and people can grow on their own. So that maintenance of me sitting, doing the same, whether it's printing shirts or on the phones or teaching courses, I'll do all of them, but I need to keep growing. Right. So that, that's my thing. And we moved from uh, Silver Core Gunworks to Silver Core Training to Silver Core Outdoors. Right. And we've done this for a reason because my interests and my passions will, will change over time. And I want to make sure that I'm providing people with the best of me and what we can put out. I love it, man. Okay. Let people know where they can stay up to date. And I think it's people probably gathered it, but let them know the kind of things, services they can access from Silver Core and how they can kind of stay up to date with what you guys got going on and, and your personal kind of adventures as well. Sure. I mean, social media is a good place to check out Silver Core Outdoors on social media, Instagram, Facebook, I think I'm at Bader.Trav is my own personal one. And you'll see me, I'm learning how to make knives right now. I'm just doing it through YouTube, but yep. figuring my way out there, learning. I didn't post any of my paragliding stuff. I'm still learning that one, but uh, never been a fan of heights. And so I figured let's I fix that. Yeah. Right? So uh, I can barely sit in a tree. My, my version of that is tree stand hunting. Yeah. I hate it. So I'm committed to to it and that's I'll it get up there and sit there until i stop shaking like a leaf yeah it's uncomfortable okay maybe yeah. it's something i need to at least try at yep. least push out into so those two things silver core we do training online training in-person training that's hunter education firearm safety firearms training we got online courses with april Voki, who's a renowned angler and world-class fly fisher um we got the core hunter education for the province of bc We've got a club. We've got members all across Canada, throughout the North America, throughout Europe. And this is, uh, originally it was for people firearms related so that they could get their ATTs and their restricted firearms license renewed based on policy requirements. Uh, and we've built it into, that's just a free thing they get yeah, and something so much more. They get insurance for hunting in the lower mainland and is up something pretty cool. I wish I could talk about it. That's coming down the pipe that, uh, we do. Uh, for the club members, uh, it's going to be big, um, but we also do like introduction to hunting, new shooters, uh, kids events. Um, so yeah, that, that's a awesome. kind of a, a roundabout thumbnail, kind of what we do. And then the, all the government work, which probably doesn't, um, uh, interest the majority of the people listen to this one. So I want you, they can check out the site. Okay. Uh, I really want to thank you for coming by today, man. Well, thank um, you for having me. We will certainly have to do this again. I feel like we just scratched the surface of a whole lot of interesting stuff. Well, I'm always open to chat on, you know, the ADHD kicks in all over the board. Thanks so much for having me. Beautiful place. It was a lot of fun. Thanks, man. I appreciate it.